Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Jones, and I'm a junior in the college studying government and Spanish. And additionally, I'm a member of the student-led John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee. Before we begin, please take a moment to just note the exits nearest to you, both on the park side of the forum and on the JFK side of the forum. Uh, in the event of an emergency, please follow the exit signs nearest to you and congregate in JFK Park. Now please take a moment to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming uh, Director of the Carr Center for Human Rights, Matthias Rissa. Good evening, everybody. My name is indeed Matthias Risse, and I'm the director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Um, and the reason it is me who this evening has the honor and pleasure of introducing uh, this year's Godkin lecturer, former president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos, is that we are thinking of this event also very much as part of our efforts to honor the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was passed. Uh, on December 10th, 1948. And literally, the reason there's this connection to what we're talking about today is because literally the first thought articulated on the preamble of the Universal Declaration is that there is this connection between human rights and then also justice and, uh, and freedom and peace in the world. So the idea that the preamble expresses is that without peace, there's no, there's no realization of human rights, and without realization of human rights, there's not going to be a peace. And so for that reason, the Colombia peace process is also a major occurrence in the human rights movement. Before saying more about that peace process, however, let me also recognize that there's another anniversary that we are honoring this year in addition to the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration, namely that uh, of the passing of the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, uh, which preceded uh, the passing of the Universal Declaration by about eight months, and that, that actually is the document that was passed, uh, was the first in general international human rights document. Uh, instrument, and it was actually passed in, in Bogota, Colombia. So this, uh, the, this declaration is also known as the Bogota Declaration. So there's another interesting uh, reference to, uh, to Colombia uh, right there. And in fact, it is, again, this, the older one between these two. However, when the Bogota Declaration was passed, a period of Colombian history uh, known as La Violencia was also just starting. And that was one especially vicious period in a conflict that is now about 100 years old uh, and is ultimately about access to Colombia's ample resources and economic opportunities. Over time, this conflict that has unfolded in various stages has taken the lives of hundreds of thousands of Colombians, has uprooted millions more Colombians, and has spread anxiety uh, and fear across Colombia for, um, for literally um, a, a century. And there have been many conflicts uh, to, to, uh, to this, there have been many parties to this conflict with the government, uh, both right-wing parties, left-wing parties, and on the left wing we especially find the FARC and the ELN. The FARC was by far the larger, it's the FARC with which President Santos uh, made the peace agreement. It was the FARC uh, that, uh, in fact, he concluded that peace with in 2016, for which then President Santos also received the Nobel Peace Prize as the, the sole recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Peace Prize in 2016. And this agreement is a historic achievement in terms of both its complexity and its inclusiveness. So it is simply fair to say that there has never been anything like it, uh, period, in uh, world history. Now, of course, at the same time, uh, it is practically impossible for a conflict of such proportions to come to a solution that would satisfy all parties. And for that reason, there's also over time been much resistance to this agreement. So President Santos' successor in office, Ivan Duque, in fact won the presidency after uh, Juan Manuel Santos on a platform opposing the peace. Uh, and the current president, Gustavo Petro, again has now taken a more positive stance towards negotiations and he has last year announced his total peace plan, a plan that now also does include the much smaller but still very important uh, ELN. 
Uh, it is important to realize, and this is also going to be subject of conversation tonight, that the conversation too continues to be very dire. And one of the regular bits of bad news coming out of Colombia is that of the assassination of community organizers and uh, peace activists and human rights activists. There's a, there's a constant stream uh, of, ass of assassinations like that, even though the intensity comes um, and goes a bit. Uh, but, you know, as the uh, old adage says, peace is something that you make with your enemies and not with your friends. And in a situation in Colombia where the peace needs to bring a resolution to 100 years of conflict, really, um, bringing the, that peace itself is a task for uh, several generations. But it is thanks to a large extent to President Santos uh, that these efforts have a firm place in Colombian institutions and day-to-day -day, uh, politics. Now, all of this is also a suitable subject for today's Edwin L. Godkin Lecture. The Godkin Lectures are among Harvard's most prestigious lecture series, and in fact, they were implemented exactly 100 years ago. So we have them since uh, 120 years ago. We have had them since 1903. The lectures honor the 19th century Irish-born journalist Edwin Godkin, who founded the magazine The Nation and also was the editor-in-chief of the New York Evening Post. And the theme of this series is the essentials of free government and the duties of the citizen. And over the years, many distinguished leaders have given this lecture. The essentials of free government and the duties of the citizen are certainly very much on the mind of this year's Godkin lecturer, Juan Manuel Santos. President Santos was in that office from 2010 to 2018, so a solid eight years. And during that time also succeeded in considerably improving uh, Colombian, um, um, Colombian social, economic, and environmental indicators, which of course is a matter that is not entirely accidental to the peace process by itself. And while he has been a politician for much of his life, he also worked a number of years as a journalist, and for this reason has always felt this very strong connection to freedom of the press. I'm delighted to say that his connections to Harvard are very deep. He earned an MPA mid-career degree from the Harvard Kennedy School in 1981. Then later was a Neiman Fellow here at the, at the university. And after his presidency, he was named the Angelopoulos Global Public Leaders Fellow for the year 2018-19. And we very fondly remember his time on campus because he made himself immensely available for meetings and conversations as the Columbia peace process more and more made its way into our curriculum. He was often seen at the legal seafood restaurant next door. He had important meetings there. That restaurant has since closed, as you know, because of the impact of COVID. Nothing else has opened there yet. And one might speculate that there's never been a good answer to the question of what would President Santos want to see here next. I'm also delighted now to introduce my colleague, Catherine Sicking, who is one of the world's leading authorities in human rights and much of whose work has focused on transitional justice, especially in, in South America, but then specifically also in Colombia. In fact, the Car Center for Human Rights Policy has long been involved with Colombia. Car Center scholars were among the very first to study the uh, magnitude and the scope of the reparation efforts that would be needed uh, after, after all these many decades of conflict, and Catherine Sicking has been the most senior one among them. Catherine is the Ryan Family Professor of Human Rights Policy here at the Harvard Kennedy School and will join President Santos on stage uh, after his address. But now, without further ado, please give a heartfelt welcome back to President Santos. I am very honored and very grateful uh, to be here again in my alma mater. Uh, thank you, Dean, and thank all, all the people responsible for inviting me on this very special occasion. As uh, Matias uh, just mentioned, 75 years of the Declaration of Human Rights and 75 years of the American Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, as he mentioned, uh, at that same time, something happened in Colombia 
that triggered a lot of violence, and that violence evolved in armed conflict with the, the guerrilla groups. I will today speak very shortly about human rights making war and human rights making peace. After the Bogotazo, 1948, American Declaration of Human Rights, the violence uh, that erupted and that, as I said, was transformed into the armed conflict, uh, the Colombian army uh, be, uh, it also started to make all kinds of um, human rights transgressions. And I go all the way to 2006 when I was appointed Minister of Defense. The record of the Colombian Army in human rights was appalling to the extent that the American Congress suspended the aid to the army and only gave money to the police. That was changed uh, later, but the prestige of the army in, t in terms of human rights was uh, at a very low level. So when I became Minister of Defense, I understood that if we wanted to win the war, we had to recuperate the legitimacy of the armed forces. Um, and so I made the respect of human rights a center of gravity in the whole doctrine of uh, the war and the doctrine of the armed forces. And uh, when I started uh, as minister, I got a visit, a visit from a former commander of the army, General Valencia, who said, uh, Minister, I know that you in the end want peace. So I give you an advice. Treat the members of the FARC not as your enemies, but as your adversaries. And I said, and what is the difference? And he said, there's a great difference. Enemies you eliminate. <coughs> Adversaries you beat, but then you have to live with them for the rest of your lives. Treat them as human beings. They have mothers, they have fathers, brothers, sisters, and respect also their human rights. And that really impressed me, and we started a very intensive and interesting campaign to change the culture of the armed forces. Usually in everywhere in the world, everywhere in the world, armed forces are very conservative institutions. To change their culture is, is difficult. But with the help of the uh, Commissioner for Human Rights in, uh, of the United Nations and the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, the British Army, we started uh, a campaign to change the culture. And we had, I found when I became minister, something which we had copied from Vietnam, the body count. And that was a terrible way of measuring the success of the army that even uh, evolved into a very terrible crime that I'll call the false positives, killing civilians and presenting them as members of the guerrillas died, that died in combat in order to get the prizes, the benefits that were awarded to the officers who had a good record, record of body counts. I had to change that dramatically. And I, I started to say, to tell the, um, the armed forces, listen, you, not, you must continue to fight, but in a different way. 
the Constitution in one hand, the rifle in the other. You must respect the law and you must respect the human rights. And no more body count. I will measure your success by the number of members of the guerrillas who demobilize, who come to our side. Second, the number of guerrillas that you capture. And third, and only if it's necessary, the number of guerrillas that you kill. Uh, so I inverted the, uh, the priorities. Uh, and I told them, this is good from the military point of view, because a demobilized member of the guerrilla that comes to our side will bring information, will cause anxiety in the other side, and will not become a victim. And so this is also good from the military point of view. And we made a very intense um, campaign, uh, advertising, for example, um, during Christmas in the rivers. There was an advertising campaign that won many prizes with messages from the mothers, fathers, or brothers of the guerrillas uh, to their the guerrilla members. And we put some messages in some bulbs in the rivers, and we allowed these bulbs to float, and they became very interested in receiving messages from their families, and the demobilization uh, was uh, increased tremendously, and the number of guerrillas that died decreased tremendously. And at the end of this campaign, I was extremely uh, satisfied that before, when I first came as minister, uh, when I went to a division, to a brigade, to a company, the commander said, we had a battle, uh, X number of guerrillas were killed. Now they started to say, we had a battle, there are 10 wounded guerrillas, they are already in the hospital, and uh, we took care of them. So they really changed the way of, of fighting the war we humanized the war. And afterwards, the commanders of the, of, the, of the guerrillas of the FARC, when we sang the peace, said, what you did really was much more um, powerful than the planes bombing our camps or the helicopters machine. That, in our morale, it changed us because we started looking at you not as the devil, but also as human beings. And that was the experience that we, we uh, uh, had waging war. When we finally uh, started the peace process, I then said, human rights must be in the center of the negotiations. And I was uh, advised uh, to put the victims and to visibilize the victims. So one of the first things I did when I got elected president was to have a law approved called the Victims Law uh, and Restitution of Land to recognize the victims and, started, and starting to repair the victims before we signed the peace process. Uh, more or less simultaneously, we started negotiating, but at the same time, taking care of the victims, repairing them, uh, and uh, visibilizing. We uh, did a, a, a very effective job. Um, the people who were in charge, to the extent that uh, a um, report from this university, I will just quote a couple of sentences of this report in 2015, a program to help Colombian citizens heal from the murder, kidnapping, and violence of that country, long-running civil war, is the most ambitious of its kind. This is one of the phrases of this report. Another one is, we were ready, we were really not aware 
of how exceptional it is. Just on scale alone, it's off the charts. And this was uh, written by a very, very distinguished professor called Catherine Sicking, uh, this report. And right now, uh, we can say that more than 1,400,000 victims have been repaired in one way or another. And uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, victims, the, or the victims that have been recognized and accounted for are over 9 million. Um, and we then put the human rights and the rights of the victims in the center of the negotiation, following what Kofi Annan had written when he was Secretary General, um, that uh, when he said, the role of law and transitional justice, justice in conflict and post-conflict societies, justice, peace, and democracy are not mutually exclusive objective, but rather mutually reinforcing, reinforcing imperatives. We, we use that as our sort of a guide. And then uh, we started to negotiate. And the victim's right, the right to justice, the right to the truth, the right to reparations, and to non-repetition. And so that was the basis of the negotiation. And when we arrived to the justice, which was a very difficult negotiation because every, in every conflict, uh, many of you know very well, Professor, that it boils down to where you draw the line between peace and justice. How much justice is a society willing to sacrifice in order to have peace? But we had, and I made a specific effort to negotiate always taking care of respecting the conventions that we had signed on human rights, the Inter-American Convention and the International Convention on Human Rights, uh, or the treaties and the conventions that were sort of a sub-product of those treaties. I even put an American in the negotiating table for the justice system. Douglas Castle is a professor from Notre Dame, and I put him as an expert in human rights with the sole purpose of uh, being very careful that nothing that was included in the agreement would go beyond the parameters of the conventions and of the Rome Statute. And he did a, a great job. Uh, many people said, what in the hell is a gringo doing negotiating in the name of Colombia? I said, well, he's doing a very good job. And he did a very good job. Um, and. Uh, that difficulty of finding a way out, giving the guerrillas a, a way out, but at the same time respecting the law, respecting uh, the conventions, uh, war, the war crimes and crimes against humanity. And that's how the transitional justice came into, uh, into uh, the negotiation and the concept of sanctioning through reparation to the victims. And so the victims were always present. And I even took vic victims to the negotiating table in Havana. That was extremely, extremely important at a certain moment in time. And I remembered uh, when I went to South Africa many years before, 1994, uh, to give Mandela, the chair of the uh, UNCTAD um, conference, that at that time, Mandela was uh, in the process of healing the wounds. And he had, in live television, um, the victims and the perpetrators getting together for the first time. And I remember him saying, this is a very important uh, exercise. It's hard. It's, uh, it, it, it is 
sometimes uh, very difficult, but it's necessary. That and Desmond Tutu, in that same um, visit, started to tell me about the importance of the truth. And so those two elements became extremely important in the negotiation. The truth, and we made a truth commission, um, which published its uh, report, I uh, told the head of the truth commission, this is, this is mission impossible. The whole truth of uh, 50 years of war is impossible. But try to make it as balanced as possible and enough truth for people to be satisfied, and I think uh, they did that job. But the process of justice, the transitional justice, um, for the first time, the two parties got together and created a tribunal that was unprecedented and agreed to submit to that tribunal, which is what is happening right now in the face of reparations, in the face of reconciliation, but always having the human rights uh, as a, a parameter, as a reference. And that gave the process tremendous legitimacy and backing from the international community um, to the extent that when I first uh, signed the victim's law back in 2012, Ban Ki-moon went to Bogota to the signature of this law and said, this is unprecedented. And I'm here to uh, say how important this president is going to be from now on. And, and the international community really appreciated uh, this, the importance that we gave to uh, the human rights throughout the whole negotiation. Um, I can go on and on, but I know that the time is, is uh, very short, but just to to give an ending to how the process uh, went. Uh, in 2021, the ICC prosecutor uh, concluded the preliminary examination of the situation in Colombia in support of domestic efforts to advance transitional justice. Um, there's an anecdote with the previous ICC prosecutor, the lady from Africa, at the beginning of the process, she was very harsh and saying, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Uh, because she had the mentality of a prosecutor. And I met her in New York in General Assembly of the United Nations. And we sat down and I said, Madam, why do you exist? And she was shocked, of course. I mean, what kind of question is that, Mr. President, she asked. Yes, why do you exist? Not as a person, of course, as a prosecutor. Who, what is behind you? The Rome Statute, right? And why was the Rome Statute, for what purpose was it negotiated? To facilitate the negotiation of armed conflicts, to facilitate peace. And uh, that's why I ask you, why do you exist? You should, instead of, Putting a, uh, uh, a pole in the in the wheel, you should be trying to help me see how we can accommodate your principles at the ICC and my principles to respect the human rights and the conventions. And she said, "My God, you are completely right," and changed her attitude 180 degrees, and that helped tremendously the process of negotiation. And we are right now in the process of reconciliation. It's hard. The truth that has come out has brought a lot of reactions. The truth many times hurts. Um, we are now about to begin with the sanctions uh, of the most responsible of crimes, of war crimes and crimes against humanity. There's a lot of controversy, and there will always be controversy because there will always be some people who claim more justice, who want more justice, and others who want more peace. That is an inevitable consequences of a peace process. We're going through that peace process right now in Colombia, but I think if we persevere, 
this peace process will be a precedent for other peace processes for a long time. Thank you. So, first, uh, it is such a pleasure to have you here with us in the HKS Forum. Welcome. Um, you've given us some great background on the peace agreement, but there's some innovations in the peace agreement you haven't mentioned yet. There's a whole chapter on gender. There's a attention to ethnicity with uh, uh, Afro-Colombians uh, and indigenous communities. And I wonder if you could tell us a little about that. Well, yes, we, we wanted to be very ambitious mm -hmm. and include uh, the rights of minorities, for example, the ethnic chapter, because the minorities had suffered more than the average Colombian, and also with the women. I say, in wars, the ones who suffer most are women. The more victims are the victims. That was the, the phrase we used. So we included a gender chapter and an ethnic chapter, but we did other innovative uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, there was a very difficult uh, negotiation around the problem of drugs. The guerrillas did not want to accept that discussion with a very simple argument. If we discuss that, we are recognizing we're drug traffickers, and we are not. We did tax the, the drug dealers, but we are not drug traffickers. And if we discuss that, the United States will, call, will extradite us. We had to fight, no, don't worry, you will not be extradited, but you must help in the solution of this problem. Uh, that was also an innovation. The whole system of justice, that is unprecedented. Uh, how the system uh, operates, the way we chose the magistrates with international uh, organizations uh, choosing the magistrates, but uh, there was a big discussion if it should be Colombian or foreign. We, uh, we accepted that the, for them to be Colombian, not foreign, but chosen by foreign, uh, by foreign entities, the, the European Court of Human Rights, the United Nations, and all that was an innovation. The justice system is certainly, and the Krog Institute, which is the, we, we chose the Krog Institute to make a, to, to follow the implementation of the peace process that has also been unprecedented. They still do a, an exam every three months mm -hmm. to see how we are doing in implementing. Um, that was also an innovation. Um, and how are you doing? Well, With not so good, not so good. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, we, I was succeeded by somebody who did not like the peace process. He tried to derail it, but fortunately we had a constitutional shield um, and he did not have the votes, the past government did not have the votes to change the agreement and the pressure of the international community was very important for him to feel obliged to follow he, at a very slow rate, but he could not derail. Mm -hmm. And this government, who has promised that it will implement the peace process, um, has promised and promised and promised, and yet we have to see real progress because we haven't seen it. I hope, I'm still optimistic, that it's because they are learning how to govern, but they have been already a year and three months, and if they don't learn fast, we're in trouble. So this was a conflict that lasted over 50 years, depending on when we say it began, and, um, and it was often seen as an intractable conflict that, that would never be settled, and yet, there has been a peace agreement. So, if, you know, we're all troubled today 
by other intractable conflicts in the world. And if you had just a few words of advice to give to people who live under intractable conflicts or who are trying to negotiate the end, what would you say? If we go back uh, 10 years or more, nobody thought that peace with the FARC would be possible. All my predecessors had tried, they failed, and they said, and when I, when I started, when I first mentioned that I was going to start a peace process, everybody said, no. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was elected in 2010 as a war hero. Mm -hmm. And how can you say that you're going to sit down with the FARC and uh, it'll cost you your capital, your political capital, it'll cost you your prestige. I had very high popularity. But I remember a very good friend of mine, Shlomo Ben-Ami, former minister of Israel, expert in Israel-Palestine because he was one of the architects of the Camp David Agreement, who said to me, I know that everybody's telling you to continue the war because you're good at it. And you have humanized it and your polls are almost 90%. But think of the following. You're right in front of your grave and you look back. How many lives would you have saved if you had taken the risk and, would, and had been successful? And that changed me completely. And I took the risk. It was very costly. My polls went down. I was called a traitor. And he told me, it might even cost you your life. It, it cost Sadat the life. It cost Rabin the life, his life. And it cost you your life. But we persevered. So my message is there is no conflict that does not have a solution. Every conflict. And I, I always use the Man Mandela's uh, famous phrase, the most powerful weapon there is, is to sit down and talk. And if that um, is possible, for example, I think that there is an opportunity here in the Palestine-Israeli terrible war that is going on. Um, there is an opportunity uh, for the world and for the P5 countries and for the Palestinians and the Israelis to get an agreement. I truly believe that if there is good leadership and willingness to open a constructive dialogue, and by constructive I mean you sit down to learn from the others, not to impose your will, I think there could be a solution. Thank you. I'm just going to ask one more question, because you know the best part of the forum is that students and other members of the audience get to ask questions. We've got, uh, we've got mics set up down here and up above. And so I want people to already start thinking of the questions you have. Maybe you can start lining up by the mics. Uh, but while you're doing that, while you're thinking of your questions, I want to ask a final question, because this is the 75th anniversary of the Declaración Americana de los Derechos y Deberes del Hombre. No? So, this was a, an agreement by 19 Latin American states and the United States in Bogota, Colombia in, in 1948. And so sometimes people still tell me, they say, oh, human rights, that is what the global north does. And they impose their values on the global south. People who never would have thought of that if they hadn't been told by people in the global north. But here we have the American Declaration. Uh, and I think, uh, I wonder if you could just say a few words about Latin American and Colombian contributions to uh, human rights. Well, I'll tell you something which goes even further. Most of the, uh, I didn't know, it was 19 or 21 Latin American countries and Chapultepec. Oh, in Chapultepec. In Chapultepec, when, when Alberto Lleras was, yeah. uh, was uh, elected chair of Chapultepec and then First, the General Secretary of the OAS, uh, the, the, but I don't, I don't remember if it was 19, anyway. Uh, Latin America was very important at that time because of the number of countries in, in the United Nations, because there were 54 countries or something like that. 50 countries. And so we had a big, a big percentage. Um, but I go back. 
in the U.S. Constitution, the first one, not the amendments, you did not have references to, you didn't call them human rights, but civil liberties. In almost every Latin American constitution, civil liberties was present. So what I try to say with this is that the people who are saying that this is an imposition from the north to the global south, they're wrong. I, I think the contribution of Latin America to the whole discussion of human rights, the creation of the OAS, the Inter-American uh, Convention of Human Rights, is something that was pushed by the South, not imposed by the North. Thank you. Um, okay, so do we see people already? I see Paula there, <laughs> one of my students. Uh, so um, I'm going to give you the first word. Paula, everyone needs to introduce themselves and ask a brief question, okay? Because you can see people in line behind you and at other mics. And so you're first, Paula. Thank you. Buenas tardes, señor presidente. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Paula. I'm an MPP here at the Kennedy School. And my question is how to prevent, you talked about this humane war. How do we prevent the co-optation of human rights language to perpetuate war? So how do we ensure that this waging of humane war isn't used as an excuse by governments to keep wars going rather than avoiding peace? Do you have a more uh, easier question? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, there are some realities. I had to make war in order to achieve peace. And I, I am not, I'm not, I don't feel sorry about it. Uh, I tried to make war in the most humane way to bring the FARC to the table. Because one of the conditions that I had identified as a necessary condition for a, a successful peace process was that the balance of power, the military balance of power, had to be in the side of the state and not inside the guerrillas. Because if the FARC thought that like they, th they thought until then, that they had the possibility of taking over through violence, they would never negotiate in good faith. So I had to fight, and I'll tell you an anecdote. I told them, no ceasefire. They wanted a ceasefire, no ceasefire. I will apply the Rabin Doctrine. And they said, what is the Rabin Doctrine? Well, Rabin, the first time he sat down with Arafat to negotiate peace, told Arafat, I will negotiate with you, I will ne negotiate peace as if there is no terrorism, but I will continue to fight terrorism as if there is no peace talks. And I applied that with the FARC, and I told them, if you kill me, that is an act of war, it's legitimate, until we reach an agreement, and nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And uh, that saved, I think, the peace process, because I, I had the opportunity of, of taking out the number one uh, FARC leader, and that did not derail the peace process. Uh, I'm going to turn to uh, the, uh, the uh, microphone up above, please. Yes. President Santo, thank you for your time. My name is Susana Rego. I'm a medical doctor from Colombia, and I graduated this May from a master in global health delivery. My fellow and I, Catalina Melendez from Colombia as well, uh, we want to make you a question related to the health care reform that is in this moment under the Congress. Uh, considering the perspectives at the forum, like the answer that you give in 2022 related with COVID-19 pandemic, um, the disparities in healthcare continue in Colombia. Uh, the most affected people is the people that live in rural areas and more marginalized. Um, and this is point that the peace agreement already treat. So what do you change, reject, about the current reform and healthcare proposal that guarantee the healthcare as a human right? I, I didn't quite understand what... Creo que se debe preguntar en español. Sí. Presidente, eh, 
estamos haciendo la pregunta relacionada con las reformas que hay en este momento en el sistema de salud de Colombia. Ah, de salud. Sí, que afecta en este momento a las personas más vulnerables que viven en las zonas rurales. Ese también fue un tema que se tocó en el acuerdo de paz. ¿Qué aceptaría usted, cambiaría o eh, reject eh, en esta nueva reforma de salud? Uh, what I did with the... When we were in the peace process, we made a constitutional amendment converting access to health system as a fundamental right, human right. So, automatically everybody had the access to uh, health, the health system. What was lacking was the infrastructure in the rural areas of good hospitals and good health services. We started doing that with the uh, territorial development plans, the 17 plans that we negotiated with the communities. And they prioritized the investment, many of them in health. Unfortunately, the, my successor did not follow through. But it's there in the agreement, and not only in the agreement, in our constitution. And that's why Colombia, in theory, has uh, 100% access to the health system, in theory, not in practice. Um, and this mic now, another one of my former civics, Alexandros. Uh, my name is Alexander, here an MPP student. As part of my program, I'm working uh, on a project in Colombia, helping uh, increase the retention of Venezuelan migrants in Colombian educational system. So my question goes is, what lessons from your negotiation, your experience, can be applied in increasing human rights of about three million Venezuelan migrants that found rescue in your country? Thank you. Well, when the Venezuelan exodus started, from Venezuela to Colombia, I took a decision. They are welcome. And they are welcome in our health system, and they are welcome in our education system, and they are welcome in our technical training system for them to get a job. Why did I do that? Because for many, many years, Venezuela very generously had accepted Colombians because of our violence, and they were a very rich country. And so we had to be uh, reciprocate. Um, and I had to make a very wise and effective campaign to avoid xenophobia, because uh, the Venezuelans came and took the jobs of the Colombians, and so um, we, and, uh, and we managed to do that. And I think that what is necessary is to continue. And, and I must say, Duque, uh, my sister, he continued with that policy. And we have to be, in that sense, generous to the Venezuelans and help them in any way possible. Because this is a, a humanitarian uh, obligation. But also, it's good for Colombia. Uh, But the best solution is to solve the problem in Venezuela, of course, which is another matter. Uh, and yes, the microphone up top. Buenas tardes, Presidente. Mi nombre es Juan Esteban Gallo. Soy estudiante de segundo año en el College de Bogotá, Colombia. Y quería preguntarle, como mirando de, de Colombia hacia el mundo, nuestro proceso de paz tiene una ventaja muy grande y fue que una, fue, es un acuerdo acordado entre gentes de misma cultura, misma religión, por lo que no es una plantilla que se pueda aplicar a cualquier conflicto alrededor del mundo. Sin embargo, en vista de lo que está pasando en Israel y Palestina y los demás conflictos armados que, que aún continúan, ¿cuáles son esos elementos claves de nuestro acuerdo de paz que cree que pueden ser aplicados a estos contextos más internacionales? The Colombian peace process has a very uh, important advantage, uh, which is that it was dealt between peoples of the same culture and religion. 
So it's not a template that can be applied to any conflict around the world. However, if we were to take some key elements of this peace process and apply them to other conflicts, mainly the Palestinian and Israeli conflict right now, uh, which do you think these points would be? Well, every conflict is different. And you cannot apply a, a golden formula from one conflict to the other. You need to analyze what are the peculiarities of each conflict. And of course, the Israeli-Palestinian is full of peculiarities. Um, but I would say that there's certain attitudes that if both sides take it, like recognizing each other, to start with, if Hamas doesn't recognize Israel and Israel doesn't recognize, well, it's very difficult even to talk. So there are some efforts of uh, some minimum common denominators that are necessary. S dialogue, recognizing each other, hopefully trying to uh, reach an agreement or maybe with the help of mediators. And I, I think, quite frankly, that if this continues as it is, um, the opportunities for the P5 countries, as I said before, could be there to impose the two-state solution. Um, everybody, has, everybody has already accepted, in one moment or another, the two-state solution. There will be no solution without the Palestinian sovereignty. Um, and the only way is for the two-state solution to be uh, recognized, to be solved, and maybe, hopefully, the United Nations, which has been so uh, ineffective, could maybe uh, do its job uh, in the best way possible. Um, yes, another a student, Ale, you wanna? Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Presidente Santos. My name is Alejandro Martin, and I'm an MPP student at the Kennedy School. The Colombian Peace Agreement was praised, among many other things, for its incorporation of environmental considerations. But what? Environmental. Oh. environmental considerations. What is the role that the environment can play in peace building processes? And how can we maximize the opportunities presented by the synergies between our efforts to achieve peace and our efforts to respond to the climate crisis? That's a very good question. Um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll tell you a short anecdote. When I got, the day I was inaugurated, I went that morning to visit the Mamos in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, the most, the, the, the purest and oldest indigenous communities in the Americas, and to ask our older brothers for their blessing to go to Congress and be inaugurated. And they, they gave me their blessing, they gave me a baton, and four a color with four stones. Um, and they said, you must make peace with the FARC, but you also have to make peace with nature. And they said, nature is mad, and she's going to take revenge, and you are going to suffer that. And a week later, the worst Nina phenomenon hit Colombia. And we were completely unprepared. So what, what I did was, ask for help. I invited Al Gore to go to Colombia and many experts, and we <laughs> constructed a whole uh, institutionality to cope with climate change and the disasters. Uh, and we started a very aggressive, aggressive uh, environmental policy to the extent that at the end I convinced the Constitutional Court to uh, accept that nature has rights. And there are three lawsuits that they accepted. Two rivers, the Atrato River, the Bogota River, and also the Amazon. And they, the Constitutional Court, for the first time, gave uh, uh, rights to a river and protected the rights of the river. That is a precedent for what is happening in the world. And if we don't have peace with nature, 
and this is, a, this is a, another problem with, with the United Nations. I was invited by the UAE two months ago to the Security Council at a ministerial level. They were chairing the Security Council because they chair the COP28. And they said, could you go and convince the Security Council you have good relations with all of them because of the Colombian peace process for them to get involved in climate change? And I went and made a speech, which is a very common sense speech. If the Security Council was created to maintain and uh, seek peace and climate change is exacerbating conflicts all around the world, well, the logical conclusion is you should get involved. They, uh, they, there were three countries that were opposed. Russia, China, because of geopolitics, uh, and Brazil, strangely enough. Um, and uh, some people consider that Brazil opposed because they don't want anybody to get involved with their Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if Jeff De Laurentiis is here, but he was at that, uh, that the meeting of the Security Council. Oh, there you are. You, you were <laughs> present there when, uh, when, um, uh, when I made that speech. Uh, but yes, this, uh, and the environmental component is transversal in the agreement, and if we want to stop deforestation, we must implement the agreement in those areas. So we are almost out of time, so I want to just have one final question, the young person at the mic up here. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm Jason. I wanted to ask about, um, in recent years, um, Colombian politics has been characterized by low approval ratings for governments both on the left and the right. So Petro's government is currently somewhere around 30% approval rating. Um, before that, Duque's government, which was of, uh, Petro's of the left. Duque, before that, who's of the right, um, was somewhere around 15 to 20%. You left power with something like 20, 25% approval rating. Why has there been uh, such a shift towards um, the general unpopularity of governments in Colombia and um, towards populism in uh, the country? Why low approval ratings for presidents in Colombia? For recent, presidents. For presidents in recent years, yes. Why do they have a low popularity? Because they have been, they have been very bad presidents. That's why do okay. <laughs> <laughs> Duque, Duque, I'm sorry to say, but Duque was. The results are there. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not inventing and I'm not judging. Simple, the evidence is there. Look at what what he received, and look what he gave Petro. Almost every indicator went down, and Petro raised a lot of expectations. And so far, he's not delivered. So people get frustrated. That's the reason why their popularity comes down. And you're quite right. Uh, that generates um, the environment for populism to uh, make uh, a feast. Um, so on that note, I want to thank uh, former President Juan Manuel Santos very much for this excellent presentation, and uh, please join me in our.